สวัสดีครับ Hello and welcome to Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha. Today we're going to be discussing the Four Noble Truths, Understanding the World View. This is Chapter Four in the book Developing a Life Practice: The Path That Leads to Nirvana. When Gautama Buddha taught over 2,500 years ago, once he attained enlightenment, he contemplated for about seven weeks of whether he should actually share the teachings that he discovered. He didn't think that the world was actually ready for what it was that he had to share with them, and he wasn't quite sure whether the world would actually take notice and start to learn and understand the teachings that he shared. Well, we know now, 2,500 years later, the world certainly took notice of what it was that he had to share. In fact, over 500 million people today consider themselves practitioners of Gautama Buddha's teachings, and that's just today. If you can imagine, over the last 2,500 years, there's been billions of people that have learned and practiced Gautama Buddha's teachings, and there's been many who have attained this enlightened mental state of nibbana. Where the mind is peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy. Well, after Gautama Buddha contemplated for seven weeks, and he finally decided to actually go teach, his very first teaching was the Four Noble Truths. That was his very first discourse, because it's in this discourse that sets up all the rest of his teaching that he shares and helps lead you on the path to enlightenment. So, without an understanding of the Four Noble Truths, a practitioner would be utterly confused and unable to actually attain enlightenment. So, if you've been on this path for a while, or you're just starting this path, it's utterly important that today, in our talk, that you learn and understand these teachings, because it's these teachings in the Four Noble Truths that is really the foundation, the foundational teaching. That's going to lead to all the other realizations that you're going to have along this path. So, without an understanding of the Four Noble Truths and then applying them in your daily practice, you and anyone else would be unable to ever attain enlightenment. And if you know that you've studied the Four Noble Truths in the past. It's particularly important that you pay attention to what it is that I'm going to share with you today, because some of the language that you may be familiar with in relationship to the Four Noble Truths is going to be very different than what I'm going to share with you. So even if you feel that you already know the Four Noble Truths, it's really important that you take your time to really listen, understand, and then apply these teachings in life so that you can see that they're truth. We call these the Four Noble Truths because Gautama Buddha knew that they were the truth. I know that they're the truth. Other people know that they're the truth. But if you do not yet know that hundred percent, absolutely, the Four Noble Truths are in fact the truth, then once again, you're going to be unable to attain enlightenment. So it's important that you understand these teachings. Know that they're truth, but then don't believe what I'm sharing with you. Don't believe that it's the truth. What you need to do is understand this intellectually, then apply it in daily life, so that then it becomes wisdom. Once you take these teachings that I'm going to share with you today and convert them from intellectual learning to now you reflect on these teachings to understand them, and then you apply them in daily life. To practice these teachings, to observe that yes, indeed, these teachings are in fact the truth, then you have wisdom, and with that wisdom, the mind will change the way that it functions and the way that it looks at the world. That's one of the reasons why we call this right view, because you're going to be looking at the world very differently once you understand these teachings intellectually. You reflect on them for understanding, and then you apply them in daily life to know that they are in fact truth, and you gain wisdom. So that's what we're planning to do today: is discuss the four noble truths. And as you have questions, feel free to type those into the comment sections of either Facebook or YouTube or the Zoom classroom. And in the Zoom classroom, you have the extra functionality of being able to raise your hand electronically, so our moderator Max can then call on you, so you can ask your question or any follow-up questions. 
So those of you guys that are typing in the comments, Max will be the one who will ask your question for you and make sure that you get the answer that you need. Because I'll be stopping at a couple different places just to give you a chance to really think about what it is that we're talking about. Again, it's very important that you do not believe anything that I say, but instead you learn it. Learn what I'm sharing, reflect on it for understanding, and then apply it in daily life so that you can gain the wisdom to know that this is, in fact, the truth. So in order to understand the four noble truths, it's important that you first understand the three universal truths. So we're going to start there. We're going to start with the three universal truths, and then we're going to move into the four noble truths. And once again, we're using that word truth, the three universal truths. Gautama Buddha knew they were truth. I know they're truth. But that doesn't help you unless you learn this intellectually, reflect on it for understanding, and then you apply it in daily life so that you can see, in fact, that it's true. And as we progress here in our talk, I will actually be questioning you and giving you examples and helping you to reflect right here in our class. So this isn't a class where I'm going to be just broadcasting to you and you just sit back and hear it like a TV program. I'm going to be sharing content with you, but then I'm going to be asking you questions and effectively asking you to reflect on what it is that I'm sharing at that particular moment. So I might talk for three to five minutes, but then I'm going to ask you questions to reflect on what it is that I just shared. And we're going to be doing that throughout the entire talk so that you get into this process of not believing what I say, but in fact, you learn, reflect for understanding, and then you apply it in daily life. And this is what everything that we've been building up to in this group learning program over the last three weeks has been leading us to this point where now you're ready to actually learn the knowledge of discontentedness, the cause, the elimination and the complete elimination of discontentedness in the mind. So let's go right into it and help you to start learning these truths and gaining this wisdom from Gautama Buddha. The three universal truths. Okay, there's three of these and I'm going to be sharing this with you in a way that teaches you what this is. But then again, I'm going to be pausing as a way to help you reflect in that moment and start to understand what these teachings are. The first universal truth is called impermanence. This is a very critical teaching for you to understand. This is the beginning. Without an understanding of this, you would not understand anything else Gautama Buddha teaches. In fact, our entire talk today, without understanding this, you will not understand anything else that he has to teach you. So impermanence. The universal truth of impermanence is that everything is constantly changing. There is no permanent fixed state. Everything's constantly in flux, whether it's material objects, possessions, relationships, our thoughts, our ideas, our states of mind. Everything in the world is constantly changing. Okay. Essentially, whatever arises is going to cease to exist. If there's something that arises, it's going to cease to exist at some point. This is a universal truth. It's true in all situations, except for enlightenment. Enlightenment itself is a permanent mental state. Okay, so let's talk about some examples here so that you can reflect on this and see that it's true. Okay, what the Buddha is sharing here is that anything that arises is going to cease to exist. That's the universal truth. Nothing is permanent. Well, we don't believe what the Buddha says. We don't believe him and you don't believe me. You've got to see the evidence for yourself. So this is where you start reflecting and you start trying to understand what is permanent in your life. Because if this is a universal truth and you can find just one thing that's permanent, 
then you've disproved the Buddha. You're smarter than the Buddha. You're more intelligent than the Buddha. And the Buddha's wrong, right? So if you can find something that's permanent, then that means this is not a universal truth. So the way to prove whether this is truth and wisdom is try to disprove it, okay? So let's look at this. What is permanent? Is our body permanent? Does it stay the same from birth all the way to death? Well, death itself is impermanence, right? It's like, okay, the body's dying. It arose and then it ceased to exist. It follows this natural universal truth, this first universal truth. The body itself is impermanent. When we were a child, we were born, <clears throat> and our body's been constantly changing ever since. <clears throat> Not only the size of our body, the shape of our body, the consistency of our skin, the color of our skin, the color of our hair, the consistency of our hair. Our hair constantly is growing. Our fingernails are constantly growing. We have saliva that's constantly being produced. Every moment, the body is constantly changing. Okay, so the body is impermanent, right? It's constantly changing. What about your relationships? Have you had the same relationships from the beginning of your life all the way through to now? Or have your relationships been impermanent? Have people been coming and going out of your life? And have you been coming and going out of other people's life? The answer is yes. Well, what about your parents? Are your parents permanent? No, nope. they're going to die someday. They've been constantly changing as well. Right? What about your jobs or your income? Have you had the same job your entire life? Or have you had the same income your entire life? Or have your jobs in your income been impermanent? Have they been changing, constantly changing throughout your life? Of course, they've been constantly changing. You've had different jobs and different incomes all the way throughout the life, right? What about your different possessions and your material objects? Have you had the same clothes your entire life? No, you've had to change them. Have you had the same shoes, the same car, the same eyeglasses, the same sunglasses? No, these things come in and out of your life all the time because they're impermanent, right? What about different thoughts or ideas or feelings that you have? When you have a feeling of sadness, is that permanent? No. What about when you have a feeling of happiness? Is that permanent? No, it's not permanent. What about when you have a feeling of boredom or loneliness? Is that permanent? No, because that changes. So this first universal truth that it's very important that you understand is everything is constantly changing. Whatever arises is going to cease to exist. Okay? Everything will leave you someday. You're essentially renting this human body, right? It doesn't belong to us. Our children don't belong to us. Our life partners don't belong to us. Our car doesn't belong to us. This isn't my job or my income. It doesn't belong to me because it's constantly changing. It's not fixed. This is utterly important as we progress in our talk today that you understand impermanence. So I'd like to pause here and see if there's any questions on impermanence, if anybody has anything that they feel is permanent that they would like to offer up and say, hey, I feel like this is permanent. Let's discuss that and make sure that you can see. So any questions anywhere, Max, in our social media or on Zoom about impermanence? Well, I don't have anything that comes to mind that I can point to as permanent. But I'd like to ask you, David, is everything impermanent, truly everything? Is there anything that is permanent? The one thing that's permanent is enlightenment, the mental state of enlightenment. Once you actually attain enlightenment, it will be permanent. The mind will be permanently peaceful, permanently calm, permanently serene, permanently content, and permanently joyful. Those mental states will never go away. And I posted something in our Facebook group this past week 
to explain why enlightenment is permanent. And in our book, Developing a Life Practice, The Path That Leads to Nibbana, if you go to the Frequently Asked Questions section, I also have that same content there that explains why enlightenment or Nibbana is permanent. It's the only thing that is permanent. That, as well as these natural laws of existence. So these natural laws that Gautama Buddha explained to us, essentially impermanence is permanent, right? That's never going to change. The fact that everything is impermanent is permanent. That's kind of one of the jokes in these teachings. People say, what's permanent? Impermanence is permanent. It's never going to change. Or the natural law of gamma, that is in existence and it will always exist until the end of time, right? So the natural laws of existence that Gautama Buddha taught are permanent and enlightenment itself. This is one of the reasons why the teachings that Gautama Buddha shared 2,500 years ago are just as applicable today as they were 2,500 years ago because what he taught is the natural laws of existence, how to train the mind through these natural laws. But these natural laws haven't changed and they won't change. That's why we say that the Buddhist teachings are timeless. There's no expiration date on his teachings because he taught the natural laws of existence and those are permanent, as well as this mental state of enlightenment or nibbana. So Chris has raised an interesting question. He says, is gravity impermanent? And it's a natural law in essence, he says. So how about that? Exactly. So all the natural laws are permanent, right? But what I would, what I would propose here is the earth itself is not permanent. This planet is not permanent. It has arisen and it will cease to exist someday. So therefore, at some point, we probably will not have gravity on this earth because the earth just won't even exist. The earth itself is impermanent. Got it, thank you, David. We have no more questions at this time. Okay, so let's move into the second universal truth. Another very key critical one for you to understand these universal truths are going to build up to help you understand the Four Noble Truths. The second universal truth is discontentedness. Okay, A lot of people, when they teach the universal truths, they will use the word suffering here. I don't use this word and I'll explain why later. Okay, I'm going to explain why later. We're going to use the word discontent, discontented, or discontentedness. This is a mental state, not a feeling by itself. It's just a mental state where the mind is discontent. Okay, let's discuss what is discontentedness. Discontentedness has three feelings, painful feeling, a pleasant feeling, and a feeling that is neither painful nor pleasant. A painful feeling are things like sadness, depression, anger, hatred, ill will, irritation, frustration, guilt, shame, fear, anxiety, stress. These are all painful feelings that the mind experiences, but they are impermanent, okay? These painful feelings in the mind are what we call discontentedness. So if the mind is sad, it's discontent. If there's depression, it's discontent. If there's anger, it's discontent. If there's frustration, it's discontent. If there's irritation, there's di it's discontent. If the mind has guilt or shame or fears or anxiety or stress, the mind is discontent, okay? That's the first feeling. The second feeling that the mind will produce is pleasant feelings, happiness, excitement, elation, etc. right? These are all just examples of pleasant feelings, 
painful feelings, pleasant feelings, and neither painful nor pleasant. So pleasant feelings of happiness, excitement, and elation are also discontent because they're impermanent, right? And you've experienced this where you've been very, very happy. You've been very excited and the mind has gone up and then it crashed, right? Or the mind got really happy and then it was sad or lonely or bored later, right? Or you've gotten really, really excited and then you trip and fell or sprained your ankle or twisted your ankle or dropped something and broke it or something happened to you because the mind got so discontent in that happiness, in that excitement, in that elation, that then it, you lost control of the mind because it was experiencing such pleasurable feelings that then something bad happened, right? Because the mind was discontent. The third feeling is neither painful nor pleasant. This is where the mind feels boredom or loneliness or melancholy or shyness, displeased, uncomfortable, unsatisfied. This is neither painful nor pleasant, kind of like uncomfortable. This is a situation where like, say you're on a bus and a stranger come and sits really, really close to you. Your mind, it doesn't feel painful. It doesn't feel pleasant. It's kind of like neither painful nor pleasant. It's just kind of like, eh, just you might not like it. It's just kind of like, eh, it's uncomfortable. It's displeasing to the mind. This is neither painful nor pleasant. Okay. These examples that I've given, like boredom or loneliness, some people say for them that's painful. Okay. And that's fine if you want to put that in painful. What I've given here is examples of what painful feelings, pleasant feelings, and neither painful nor pleasant. These are examples that I feel map into these feelings. But the key takeaway for this universal truth of discontentedness is that the mind experiences three feelings, painful feelings, pleasant feelings, and feelings that are neither painful nor pleasant. Okay, that's what the Buddha says. The mind experiences these three feelings. Well, now that you have that intellectual understanding, now let's reflect on it and see if it's true. Well, all you have to do is disprove the Buddha and then you know it's not true, right? So what feelings in your mind do you experience that don't map into one of these three feelings? Can you think of a feeling that you're not sure where it maps into one of these three or you think it doesn't fit to one of these three? Because if you can find just one feeling that doesn't map in to these three feelings, then you've disproved the Buddha, and this isn't a universal truth. Any questions on what you think might be a feeling that you have and that you're experiencing that doesn't fit into one of these three? I think at the moment, no questions here, David. Okay, so let's go into discontentedness some more, okay? Because I wanted to give you that kind of surface level understanding of these three feelings. Now let's dive into it a little bit deeper, okay? Here you see that there's three feelings, painful feelings, pleasant feelings, neither painful nor pleasant. The teachings of the Buddha, what we're going to be doing on this path to enlightenment is we're going to be working to eliminate this discontentedness in the mind. Because as long as the mind is discontent, it can't be peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy. So if the mind is experiencing sadness, it's not enlightened. If the mind is experiencing happiness and excitement and elation, the mind is discontent. It's not enlightened. Or if the mind is experiencing boredom or loneliness or shyness or uncomfortable, it's not enlightened, okay? So as you hear me say that, that the Buddhist teachings are to eliminate discontentedness, you might be thinking, hold on a second, I like happiness. Why am I eliminating happiness? So let's discuss this. 
Happiness is an impermanent feeling. You can't maintain it permanently. However, most of us in the world have been taught to pursue happiness. Everybody and anybody, most people in the world are pursuing happiness. Everybody's chasing this happiness. I want this happiness. I need to be happy. Well, what do you need to be happy? Well, I want a car. I want this job. I want this income. I want a life partner. I want children. I want a house. I want this. I want this. So happiness is based on these conditions. The mind says, I will be happy when I get all of these things. But the problem with that is all of these things are going to go away and are going to leave you. Or even if you get that job, you're going to want more and more and more. If you get that income, you're going to want more and more and more. If you get famous, you're going to want more and more and more. So the mind can't hold on to this happiness because the happiness is based on some external condition. Because the mind has this outward searching, this outward seeking, this grasping, this looking for something external to create internal happiness, the mind can never be permanently joyful because it's looking external for this happiness. And as long as the mind's doing that, you'll never reach enlightenment. And we're going to talk about this more as part of the Four Noble Truths. So discontentedness, part of discontentedness is happiness, being so happy because of some situation that has occurred. And as soon as the feelings of that situation wane, the mind's going to go back to being bored or sad or lonely or angry or frustrated. And the mind just keeps bouncing around all three of these impermanent mental states. First, the mind's sad. Then it's excited. Now it's bored. Now I feel hatred. Now I'm angry. Now I feel fear. Now it feels guilty. Now I feel lonely. Now I feel uncomfortable. Now I feel excited. Now I feel elated. The mind just keeps moving around and bouncing around all these impermanent feelings because the mind is holding on to these external things that is affecting the mind. The mind is shaken up by all these external things. So what we're doing in this path to enlightenment is we're training the mind to eliminate the mind holding on to these external conditions that are causing the painful feelings, the pleasant feelings, and the feelings that are neither painful nor pleasant. We're going to get into that more with the Four Noble Truths. Notice that I didn't use the word suffering. Most places that discuss Gautama Buddha's teachings, most books that you pick up, will use the word suffering. They'll say that the Buddhist teachings are to eliminate suffering. Okay? I don't use this word because the word suffering, to me, only relates to one of these feelings, to painful feelings. In the unenlightened mental state, if you're excited, you wouldn't say that you were suffering. Probably even if you were bored or lonely or shy. If you were shy, you wouldn't say you were suffering, right? Or if you were just uncomfortable on the bus sitting next to that stranger, you wouldn't say you were suffering, right? So if we use this word suffering, it only relates to one third of what the Buddha was talking about to eliminate. It only relates to 33%. The other 66 and two thirds percent we're missing that understanding in the word suffering. So if you're working on this path to eliminate suffering, then you're only working to eliminate 33 and one third of what it is that the Buddha was teaching and encouraging and sharing guidance to help you train the mind to eliminate. You're missing this other 66 and two thirds percent of what it is that he was talking about. And that's one of the reasons why if you've been on this path for a while and you've been relating this path to the word suffering, you haven't attained enlightenment yet because you're not looking at the full picture of what Gautama Buddha was talking about. What he was talking about is discontentedness. 
He was talking about discontent mind, a discontented mind, discontentedness, where the mind experiences painful feelings, pleasant feelings, and neither painful nor pleasant. Because if the mind's going to be in the middle and experience this middle way, and the mind starts feeling sad, depressed, anger, frustration, guilt, shame, fear, the mind is discontent. Sure, it's suffering. It's discontent. Bring the mind back to the middle. Now the mind experiences happiness, excitement, elation. It's not suffering. It's happiness, it's excitement, it's elation. It's discontent because that's going to lead to unwholesome results. As long as the mind is moving towards this excited, elevated mental state, these feelings that are excited and elevated, as long as the mind is moving towards that, it's discontent and unwholesome things are going to happen. You don't have the focus, the concentration, the memory and the clarity of mind because the mind is too happy, it's too excited, it's too elated. So the Buddhist teachings are that mind is discontent. It's happy, it's excited, it's elated. We need to bring it back to the middle, right? And likewise, if the mind is bored or lonely or shy or uncomfortable, the mind is discontent. It's not satisfied with what is. It's not content. It's not peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy. It's bored, lonely, shy, displeased, uncomfortable. We need to bring it back to the middle. So whenever you see the mind going off like that, part of what I'm going to teach you in this program is how to bring the mind back to the middle to eliminate this sadness, this depression, this anger, this guilt, shame, fear, anxiety, stress, to eliminate, yes, this happiness that's based on all these external conditions. Yes, this excitement, this elation, we're going to eliminate that because the mind can't reside there permanently. And as long as you allow the mind to go there permanently, then it's always going to swing back to the other side. As long as you allow the mind to go to that happiness, excitement, and elation, based on some external conditions, that means you're setting yourself up for failure and it's going to swing over to this sadness, anger, frustration, irritation, guilt, anxiety, and stress because it can't maintain that happiness permanently. And as long as you allow the mind to go down into boredom, loneliness, shyness, and uncomfortable, displeased feelings, as long as you allow the mind to do that, it's going to be discontent. It can't maintain this middle way, which is peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy. Okay, so the Buddhist teachings are all about eliminating the discontent mind, eliminating discontentedness, where the mind can attain this permanent mental state where it's not affected by this external conditions and it can reside permanently peaceful, permanently calm, permanently serene, and permanently content, and permanently with joy. There's lots of joy in the enlightened mind, but it won't be happy. Happiness is based on some external condition. The joy that you experience in enlightenment, there's no external condition that's creating it. It's just naturally joyful. It's joyful by itself. It doesn't need anything. It doesn't need a new iPhone. It doesn't need a new car or a new salary or a new boyfriend or girlfriend or new clothes. The mind's going to always be joyful. It's going to be independent of these external conditions. It's not going to be grasping for all these external conditions to create this joy. It's just going to be inwardly joyful all the time. Okay? This is why a lot of the statues you see with the Buddha, he's always smiling, right? Because he's always joyful, right? He's always joyful. Okay? So we're eliminating these three feelings, discontentedness. That's a universal truth, that discontentedness exists and it has these three feelings, painful, pleasant, neither painful nor pleasant. 
Let me stop and see if we have any questions. We have a question from Judith. So does then the word dukkha mean discontentedness and not suffering? Yes. The other, excuse me, the other words that you're going to see is you're going to see people using the word suffering, which hopefully you see now that it, the Buddha didn't teach about suffering. That's not what he taught. But the word that you're going to see in the original source texts is, is dukkha. This word dukkha translates more accurately to discontent, discontented, or discontentedness. Because when the Buddha describes what is dukkha, he gives these three feelings. He says dukkha is painful feelings, pleasant feelings, and feelings that are neither painful nor pleasant. Well, that's what the Buddha said, and suffering doesn't describe painful, pleasant, and neither painful nor pleasant. Because when you're happy, excited, elated, you wouldn't say you were suffering. And when you were shy, or you're uncomfortable, or unsatisfied, you wouldn't say you were suffering. But the mind is discontent. So yes, dukkha is discontentedness. 100% correct. Thanks, David. We have a question from Amina. She asks, I have a question about bringing the mind back the middle. When mindful and understanding that we are responsible for our discontentedness our, and our moods, coming back to the middle sometimes happens afterwards, which means learning is happening, but the pattern continues. For example, whenever I have to encourage my daughter to do her educational work at home, especially during a lockdown, she resists. Okay, so what we're going to do, Max... Quite a, lot, quite a long question. So Ma Max, I, let's, let's yeah. handle this when we talk about the Four Noble Truths, because okay. that's where we'll talk about the solution. Right now, we're still kind of talking about the Universal Truths, mm -hmm. and then when we talk about the Four Noble Truths, we're going to lay out the problem and the solution of how to fix this. So Amina's question relates to more, how do you fix it? Okay, we we'll save this one. Okay, any others? We have no more questions at the moment. Okay, so now that you've got the two universal truths, let's go to the third universal truth. The third universal truth is called non-self, okay? This is a universal truth, okay? Let me explain it to you, and then I'll give you some examples to help you practice this. The universal truth of non-self is basically saying there is no permanent self. There is no you. There is no I. There is no me. Let's understand what exists in the unenlightened mind, and then let's understand this truth that you need to understand in order to get to enlightenment, okay? What the unenlightened mind has is it has a permanent self. The unenlightened mind has a permanent fixed self in the mind. And the unenlightened mind thinks that there is a permanent self. It thinks that typically this body is David, David Roylands. If I, if I ask you, where is Max or where is Judith or where is Javier? Where is Amina? Most people are going to point, say, where are you? I'm right here. And they will point to them to the body. But essentially what you're pointing to is you're pointing to a shirt. That's not you. It's a shirt. So we get rid of the shirt and we say, where are you? And now you point again. No, 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 that's the skin. You're just pointing to the skin, the outer layer of the body. So let's rip that skin off. That's not you. The skin isn't you. So now point to you. Point again. No, that's the ribs. That's the bones. That's not you. That's ribs. That's bony material. So let's rip the bones out of the body. Where are you? Maybe you point again. No, that's the lungs. That's fluid. That's bodily tissue. That's not you. There is no you. But the problem in the unenlightened mind that you probably are struggling with right now is that the unenlightened mind has a concept 
of a permanent self in the mind. And because you feel that this is you, this body or this mind is you, because the mind thinks that way and has the concept of a you, of a me, of an I, now the mind starts to have problems. It becomes very selfish. This self-identity and this self-image that is being held in the mind, this conceptual self that's being held in the mind, it's causing you problems because now you're going to want to protect the self. When somebody says something displeasing to you, you don't like it and you become frustrated or irritated or angry and you may even talk bad back to them. And it's causing you problems because you're trying to protect this self-image, this self-identity. And you think that there's this permanent self in the mind. And because you're holding on to this permanent self, you now want to protect it. Whenever somebody says something displeasing, you now revolt and you protect it. Okay? You essentially are reacting through animal instincts to protect this everlasting self that the unenlightened mind is holding on to. But what you need to get to in order to get to enlightenment is you need to realize that this concept of a permanent self that you're holding in the mind doesn't exist. The self-identity and the self-image, this concept of a self in the mind that you're holding on to, it doesn't exist. You need to dissolve this concept of a self in the mind. Because as long as you hold on to it, the mind will not be peaceful. It will not be calm. It will not be serene. It will not be content. And it will not be joyful. Because the mind's always going to be looking out fearfully. Who's going to step on me next? Who's stepping on me and I'm about to get angry if anybody says something that I don't like? And the mind is going to constantly react in situations rather than respond. So this concept of a permanent self that's in the mind that you've held on to, you can see right here today that it doesn't exist. Here's how you see that. Look back to your past when you were a child, when you were a teenager when you were an early adult. Think about the image that you had of yourself. Who were you at that time? And who are you today? If you look back over your past, you has been constantly changing, right? There is no permanent, everlasting self because you the self has been constantly changing. It's impermanent. There is no self. But the way that you know there is no permanent self is because when you look back at your childhood, your teenage years, your early adulthood, the image and identity that you had for yourself has been constantly changing. It's not fixed. It's not permanent. So therefore, there is no permanent self. The self that you have in the unenlightened mind is made up of how you see yourself. Your self-image of how you see yourself and how you want other people to see you. Your self-identity is made up of these concepts that what you want other people to see of you. And you're holding on to this image of who you think you are. And now you're trying to project that into the world. And then when somebody goes against that or somebody does something that's displeasing, now the mind reacts with hostility. Yourself is also even made up of expectations other people have of you. So your parents, your siblings, your life partners, your children, these people look at you at a certain way and they tell you how they think of you and how they look at you. And now the mind tries to live up to that. 
But whatever that is, the mind can't ever quite get there. It can't quite ever get to those expectations that everybody has of you because there is no you. So the mind can't be permanently peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy because it's constantly struggling to try to get up to these expectations that everybody has for you and the expectations that you have of you rather than just resting and saying, there is no self. I just exist. There's a body There's a mind that has come together for this existence, but this permanent everlasting self that's being held in the mind is just causing massive complications in your life. Problems that you probably don't even realize right now, or maybe you do. That's why you're learning here, right? So this concept of a permanent self has to get dissolved to where the person then understands there is no self. And then when there is no self, then you won't protect the self like an animal does. An animal protects the self and it has to have a self, but you don't. When you eliminate the self and you dissolve the self, then you won't be selfish, right? This is my phone. I'm not letting you use my phone or I'm not sharing my food or I'm not sharing my money or I'm not sharing. This is mine or the mind becomes very possessive over things like our children or our partners. This is my child. How dare you talk to my child that way? How dare you give my child a failing grade in school? How dare you? This is my child. No, it's not. It's not yours. It doesn't belong to you. Nothing belongs to you because there is no you. If there is no you, then nothing belongs to you because everything's impermanent. The phone's impermanent. The job's impermanent. The child is impermanent. The relationships are impermanent. If we hold on to all this stuff so tightly because of the self, then as soon as it's gone, because it's impermanent, the mind's going to be discontent. The mind's going to experience sadness anger, frustration, as soon as something is displeasing to the mind because of this self, it's going to cause problems. So you need to eradicate this self. It takes time to do this. This is more of an intermediate to an advanced teaching, but I introduce it to you here because one of the ways you can practice non-self is being humble, being peaceful. Don't take ownership over possessions and relationships. Just let things ebb and flow as you need to, right? Don't become selfish. The Buddha talked about being open-handed, right? Be open-handed. Don't hold on to things so tightly. Be open-handed, okay? So there's more to understand about non-self and there's more to practice in order to dissolve the self. But it's important for you to understand this as part of the three universal truths because you can see pretty clearly there is no self, even though your mind or the mind, not your mind, because there is no you, the mind thinks there's a self. And that's what's causing a lot of this discontentedness in the mind is because as long as the mind holds on to that self, it's going to continue to experience discontentedness. It's not until the mind learns and practices more and more of these teachings, ultimately eliminating the self, that you eventually get to that first stage of enlightenment. And you can progress further on where eventually the mind becomes permanently peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy. One of the big reasons why is because you need to eliminate this self. And by doing that, The mind can then reside permanently in the middle in this enlightened mental state as you eliminate all the other 10 fetters in the mind. But this is a big one, very important one. Any questions on non-self? We have a question from Manal. At this stage of investigation, 
is it fair to equate your breath as you or yourself during meditation? No, the breath isn't you. It's just air. It's just air. That's not you. The body's not you. The mind's not you. The breath is in you. The lips aren't you. There is no you here. It's just a physical body and a mind that's come together for this existence. And as soon as this existence is over, when the body physically dies, the mind is gone as well. So there is no you. Nothing exists. It's just a bunch of elements, earth, air, fire, and water. The body is just four elements that falls away and returns back to the four elements. It's the four elements now, but it's going to return back to the earth. So there's just the physical body and there's this mind. It's come together for this existence. It's impermanent. It experiences all this discontentedness. And if you don't attain enlightenment, the body dies, the mind is done, the mind extinguishes as well, and then there's going to be a new life in the cycle of rebirth. If there's a physical body and there's a mind, it's born into this life, it experiences this life, it attains enlightenment, the physical body dies, the mind then is done, and we don't know what happens after that. Once someone attains enlightenment and dies, we don't share what happens next, okay? The Buddha didn't share it, it's an undeclared teaching. But you will be so peaceful, so calm, so serene, and so joyful, having attained enlightenment, you won't care what's next. If there is something next, we don't know, right? Some people will tell you if you attain enlightenment and you die, everything's extinguished. But we don't know that to be true because the Buddha never actually taught it. Although a lot of people share that that's what he taught. That's not what he actually taught. Adam Rogerson asks, does the gaining of enlightenment change a person's relationship to three universal truths? Moving towards enlightenment, will you will understand these three universal truths inside and out, backwards and forwards, upside down, all different directions. So in terms of your relationship to these three universal truths, attaining enlightenment, you will understand them backwards and forwards, and you have to understand them backwards and forwards. So one of the ways to practice this, what I did when I first under started to understand impermanence is I walked around for several days, if not weeks, and I just kept trying to find anything that's permanent. I just walked around because I didn't believe what the Buddha said. I just walked around, what's permanent? Is this book permanent? No. Is this remote control permanent? No, it's gonna to cease to exist someday too. It's gonna to break, it's gonna fall apart, it's going to get thrown out, right? Is this glass permanent? No. Is this phone permanent? No. Is this body permanent? No. What's permanent? I just walked around for days, if not weeks, just constantly looking for things that were permanent. I was trying to disprove the Buddha. So if you need to do that, do that until you soak it so deeply into the mind that you can know that impermanence is 100% truth and now you've got that wisdom. Then with discontentedness, every time you have a feeling arise, map it into one of these three feelings. So if you start feeling angry at some point this week or next week, right away, tell yourself that's painful feelings. The mind's discontent. If you start feeling happy or excited or elated right away, ah, that's pleasant feelings. The mind's discontent. Just identify it, right? If you start feeling lonely or bored or shy or uncomfortable or just kind of like, eh, blase, blase, eh, ah, neither painful nor pleasant. Map your fe the feelings that you're having, map them into these three individual feelings until you can see them so utterly clear that the mind is just so mindfully aware, just boom, boom, boom. As soon as the feeling arises, that's painful, that's pleasant. That's neither painful nor pleasant. 
as soon as it comes. Ah, there's some peace. The last couple of hours, the mind's been peaceful. Hasn't wanted anything, doesn't need anything. It's just peaceful. Ah, that's peaceful. Oh, here's some frustration. Painful. Oh, now I'm excited. Oh, excited. There's pleasant. Ah, uh, just blase, blase. Neither painful nor pleasant. You got to see it so clearly so that when these feelings arise in the mind with awareness of mind, you can identify it because the goal is to bring the mind to the middle and only you can do that. So if you know the middle is the peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy, whenever the mind drifts to either side or into boredom or loneliness, you've got to be aware of that with mindfulness, awareness of mind, because as soon as you observe it, boom, you can bring it back to the middle. As soon as the mind goes over here, boom, you can bring it back to the middle. So one of the things you can do this week and next week is anytime a certain feeling arises, immediately identify it and categorize it as either painful, pleasant, or neither painful nor pleasant. And then when somebody says something that's displeasing to the mind about your image or your character or your personality or your identity, and you start getting angry and hostile and frustrated about that, that's the self. That's the self. That's why, right? That's one of the reasons why is because of the self, you hear something that's displeasing about the self and there's the self. That's how you know that the unenlightened mind is holding on to this self, right? So as you hear people say things or do things or they talk about the self or you have certain expectations of yourself, you have expectations of yourself and you don't meet those expectations then you feel guilty. You feel shameful. That's the self. There it is. That's the self. Aha. Uh -huh. I caught it. That's why, because I'm expecting something of the self. Or when you take ownership over your child or you take ownership over possessions or your partner and you become selfish and hold on to something really tight. Aha. Uh -huh. That's the self. So you can actually take these three universal truths because they're universal truths, because they're the natural laws of existence, you can see them in your own life. This is what I mean when I say, don't believe me, independent verification. Learn these teachings and then independently verify them in your own life. Because these are universal truths, because they're the natural laws of existence, you can take these three things and you can identify them in your life and say, wow, that's the truth. Now you've got wisdom. Once you independently verify this for yourself, now you've got wisdom if there was a self, right? So you're independently verifying this for the mind to gain this wisdom. And once you take these three universal truths and then you walk around for the next week or two or three or four, however long it takes, and you confirm every last one of these things that I just shared with you, then you've got the wisdom to know that these are in fact three universal truths. They are the natural laws of existence. And now you've got the wisdom to understand that these are in fact truth. Now, let me share this with you as well. We use the word I or me or you because our language is incapable of fully describing what actually exists. OK, there's this body, there's this mind. It comes together, it breaks apart at death, and then there's nothing, right? Nothing exists. There's no word in our language to explain nothing, right? So we get this name, David. It's a label that's given to me at birth that labels this body and this mind coming together so that when people are talking about this body and this mind, grandma and mom and dad and teachers at school and people in the neighborhood, they know you're referring to David, that body and that mind. Or in your case, Alan or Max or Amina or Javier or anybody, right? We all get these names to make it easy for 
other people to refer to this existence of this body in this mind. But where the problem comes in is because the limitations of our language, we have to use these names, which are just labels. We have to use the I, the me, the you. We start identifying a self with these names and with these labels. So when someone gets this name, they embody this name of David, and now they assign all this self-identity and self-image to it. And now I am David. And now when somebody says something that David doesn't like, David's going to get angry. But if there is no David, and you just recognize that that's a label that was given to you at birth, and you recognize there is no I, there is no me, there is no you, and you stop associating with that language, even though you're going to use it to a certain extent, if you stop associating with that language, now you don't become possessive. Now you don't try to take ownership over this identity and this image. You don't take ownership over your life partner, your children, your possessions. You recognize all these things as impermanent so that when something happens, it's just a matter of applying solutions to fix the problem rather than becoming discontent because my car got scratched or because I lost my phone or because I lost my job. If it's my job and I own it and it's mine, now when I lose my job, now the mind's going to come discontent. But if we eliminate this association with I, my, me, you, David, if we stop associating with that and recognize that there is no self, now the mind can be peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy. But as long as we hold that concept of a self in the mind, it's going to sabotage and cause a lot of reactions in our life that are going to cause problems. So your relationship as you become more enlightened with these three universal truths becomes deeper but you have to walk around and soak it into the mind so that you know these things to be truth so that then you have the wisdom and it has to be just unwavering. You just have to know it really, really well. So identify impermanence, right? Somebody calls you up and cancels a meeting rather than us getting angry up. Ah, there's impermanence. You're working on your computer and the computer freezes. Up, ah, there's impermanence. It can't work permanently, right? If you drop something and break it, rather than getting angry, there's impermanence, right? Impermanence, impermanence, impermanence everywhere. You're going to see it everywhere. And you need to see it everywhere in order for you to move to this enlightened mental state. Okay, we have a question from Sue. I understand that there is no me, but doesn't our consciousness exist? The consciousness exists, but it's not you. It's just a mind. It's like a cardboard box. The cardboard box gets filled up with all this stuff throughout life. All this trauma, all these experiences, good and bad and different, pleasant feelings, painful feelings, feelings that are neither painful nor pleasant are in this cardboard box. And what you're doing in enlightenment on this path is you're emptying out the cardboard box, getting rid of all that trauma that the mind holds on to, getting rid of all those painful, pleasant, and neither painful nor pleasant feelings, getting rid of all that stuff, getting rid of all that conditioning. People told you you are worthless, no good. You can't do anything good. Or people told you, you're so wonderful, you're so great, you're so fabulous, right? You're getting rid of all that conditioning. You're emptying out the cardboard box to get to this natural enlightened mental state where the consciousness can be pure and it doesn't have all this conditioning in it. But even when you purify the consciousness, it's still not you. There is no you. We have a question from Mercia. How does karma relate to non-self, especially in rebirth? Let's hold that for another discussion. I want to make sure that we get into the Four Noble Truths. That question is a deeper question. So Marcia, 
if you can hold that and see if we have time at the end, or if not, then we have Wednesday or another day that we can talk about that question. Okay, we have a question from Roberts. How would I avoid a complacent attitude towards non-self? Meaning that I take on an attitude of, so what, things will change anyway. Great. <laughs> <laughs> so what? Yeah, exactly. There is no self. So what? But you've got to still get rid of it. Maybe intellectually, you're saying there is no self. So what? But if you're going around and protecting the self, just because you say, so what, doesn't mean that you've eliminated the self. But the fact that you're saying that is actually helpful because it maybe can lean into you eradicating this self and letting go of this self. So we have a question from Javier. I'm not my body or my mind, but I think I am the one who likes and dislikes things and wants or doesn't want things. What I like or don't like might have changed, but I think that one is still the same. Not quite hearing the question there. Do you have a question? Maybe we'll just give Javier a moment to Okay. That if he needs to. So let's move into the Four Noble Truths then. And we can always talk about non-self some more at the end. Okay. Before we move into non-self or before we move into the Four Noble Truths, let's first discuss craving, desire, attachment. Okay. This is another crucial understanding that you need before you explore the Four Noble Truths. When we talk about craving, desire, attachment in these teachings, what are we talking about? What we're talking about is we're talking about a mental longing for something with a strong eagerness. You know how the mind kind of pulls and it craves it desires, it really wants something, it really expects something, it just got to have it. And then if the mind doesn't get it, it becomes discontent. That's what a craving desire attachment is. Expectations, wants, holding, grasping, this longing in the mind, wanting something with a strong eagerness. What we can do in life is we can pursue things as an interest, a goal, or an objective. But when it drives the mind through this craving, desire, attachment, expectations, wants, it wants to hold on, it's grasping, it's longing, it has this strong eagerness for something, that's going to cause the problems, which we're going to talk about in the Four Noble Truths. So it's important that you understand what a craving, desire, attachment is. When we say craving, we don't just mean like, hmm, I'd like to eat some chocolate today. We think of that as craving because the, the, the stomach wants something. In the English language, that's typically how we describe a craving. But when you think about craving, desire, attachment in the Buddhist teachings, you need to understand that we're using many words in English to explain what the Buddha was talking about, right? Because the Buddha's teachings are very profound. Sometimes you can't use just one word to explain what it is that he was talking about. So you'll hear this words, craving, desire, attachment. This is the mental longing for something with a strong eagerness. Also, when you have expectations or wants, or you're trying to hold something, or you're grasping for something. This is a mental longing with a strong eagerness, right? Say you're sitting somewhere in a big arena and you're holding a seat for your friend. And let's just say you're paying attention to what's going on in front of you and some stranger comes up and takes the seat. Oh, you are holding that for your friend, right? The mind's like, no, 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 that's for my friend, right? That's why there's that strong reaction because you're holding that seat for your friend. I'm not saying whether you're right or wrong for doing that. What I'm saying is that's why the mind reacts the way that it does, because the mind has this longing, this strong eagerness to hold this seat for the friend. And that mental longing with a strong eagerness is going to produce 
either painful feelings, pleasant feelings, or feelings that are neither painful nor pleasant, which is what we're going to talk about in the Four Noble Truths. But it's really important that you understand what a craving, desire, attachment is. And it's even more important that you associate any expectations, anything that you want, anything that you're holding, anything that you're grasping for. Those are other words that we basically associate with this mental longing for something with a strong eagerness. Okay, any questions on what a craving, desire, attachment, these expectations, wants, holding, grasping, any questions on that whatsoever? And one of the things that you should be doing now, remember, don't believe me, you should be going through your mind as I'm teaching right now and identify that you understand what this is in your own life. Because you've experienced this multiple times where you've had this longing for something. You just want a new job so badly, or you want a boyfriend or girlfriend, or you want a certain income, or you want a pair of shoes, or you want a car. Your mind has these never ending cravings, desires, attachment, this mental longing. And you just knew if you got that one thing, you would be happy. You would be so happy if you just got that one thing. And if you got it, you were happy. But then the happiness went away because it was impermanent. Or if you didn't get that one thing that the mind just wanted so badly, then the mind became frustrated. It became sad. It became irritated. That's what a craving desire attachment is. That mental longing with something for, with a strong eagerness. Any questions on what is a craving desire attachment before we move into the Four Noble Truths? Sometimes, David, I've heard you say that we can still be interested in things and we can still pursue things and have goals, but it's when that becomes a longing, wanting, clinging, grasping, that that's what causes problems. And so these are two very different things and it can sometimes seem like a fine line between the two. I was wondering if you have any thoughts on how to spot the difference and how we can navigate the difference so it doesn't become a strong longing. Yeah, we'll talk about that on the next one. Okay, we'll do that. We have a question from Amina. Craving is whenever we are disappointed by something. Disappointment is discontentedness. When you're disappointed, that mind is then discontent. That's not a craving, desire, attachment. The craving, desire, attachment is that mental longing, that wanting, that eagerness, that strong eagerness. And now I don't get what I want and the mind's disappointed. Now the mind's discontent. So you want your daughter to have good grades. You want her to move her grades from C's to B's or whatever your grading system is. You want your daughter to do certain things because you have certain expectations. And when she falls short of those expectations, now mom is disappointed. Mom is discontent because of, as you're going to see in the Four Noble Truths, because of this craving, desire, attachment, these expectations where the mind has this longing, this strong eagerness for something, the mind is causing itself to be disappointed. But the disappointment itself is discontentedness. Okay, we have no more questions at the moment. Okay, so now let's get to the heart of what it is that we are actually planning to talk about. We spent the last hour and 15 minutes just to get you to this point where we can now discuss the Four Noble Truths. Okay, the Four Noble Truths are also what we call right view. If you notice this chapter four, it's called the Four Noble Truths, Understanding the World View. You have to have right view of the world. Without having the right view, you would be utterly impossible to ever attain enlightenment. This is the first step. This is the reason why the Buddha taught this first, because without right view, a practitioner will be incapable of ever attaining enlightenment. You have to understand right view. And right view is the first step 
on this path to enlightenment we call the Eightfold Path. So the Four Noble Truths is right view. The first noble truth, everyone that is unenlightened will experience discontentedness. So if your mind experiences those painful feelings, pleasant feelings, and feelings that are neither painful nor pleasant, then you know that you're currently unenlightened. So if you're experiencing sadness, anger, frustration, irritation, guilt, boredom, shame, fears, if you're experiencing any of those painful feelings or others, you know that the mind is unenlightened. If you're experiencing happiness, excitement, elation, those pleasant feelings, if you're getting those feelings, your mind is unenlightened because it's base, those feelings are being produced because of certain conditions in the mind. Those pleasant feelings are an indication that the mind is unenlightened. They're temporary, they're impermanent, right? A mental state of enlightenment is permanent. If your mind is experiencing feelings of neither painful nor pleasant, boredom, loneliness, shyness, melancholy, uncomfortable, displeased, unsatisfied, then you know the mind is unenlightened, okay? No big deal. There's lots of unenlightened people in the world. The reason why you're learning these teachings is so that you can pursue this enlightened mental state. But all unenlightened beings are going to experience discontentedness. Once the mind is enlightened, it will be permanently peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy. All of those painful feelings, pleasant feelings, and feelings that are neither painful nor pleasant will have been eliminated. Okay? So the first noble truth, everyone that is unenlightened will experience discontentedness. The second universal, I'm sorry, the second noble truth, discontentedness is caused by our own attachments because the mind craves for everything to be permanent when everything in the world is impermanent. Okay, we're gonna say that a few times, break it down and give you some examples. Okay, discontentedness is caused by our own attachments because the mind craves for everything to be permanent when everything is impermanent. Okay, the mind becomes discontent and we are causing it ourselves in the unenlightened state. The mind is causing its own discontentedness because the mind has this mental longing and this strong eagerness for things to be permanent when everything is impermanent. The mind wants to hold on to things. The mind craves, desires, attaches, has these expectations, these wants, this holding, this grasping, and it keeps lurching out, trying to hold on to things permanently. But then, because everything is impermanent, the mind produces its own sadness, frustration, anger, happiness, excitement, elation, boredom, loneliness, and then those feelings are impermanent. Let me give you some examples. If you've had anybody close to you that has died, this is why the mind became sad or maybe felt guilty or even angry and then ultimately lonely because those people died. You can't stop them from dying because everything's impermanent, right? They had to die. There was only one reason why they died. The reason why they died is because they were born. Because they were born, they had to die. Nobody took them away from you. Nobody's punishing them. Nobody's punishing you. They only died because they were impermanent. Whatever arises will cease to exist. Those people in your life that have died, they were impermanent. However, the mind craves, has this longing 
this strong eagerness, it wants permanence. That's what the mind wants. The mind doesn't like impermanence. The mind doesn't like change. The mind wants to hold on. It wants to hold on to this relationship, whether it was a parent, a grandparent, a life partner, if your child has passed away, if a friend or family. The reason why you may even be sad just listening to me talk about this death is because your mind is still holding on. It still craves permanence. It wants this relationship permanently because the mind is unaware of impermanence. Because the mind doesn't realize this is a universal truth, because the mind does not understand this wisdom that everything is impermanent and the mind is latching on and holding on, craving permanence, the mind causes itself to be discontent. The mind is causing the anger, the sadness, the boredom, the loneliness, all those discontent feelings, the mind is causing it itself because it's trying to hold on to things permanently. So death is a good example of this. Another example, you've been in relationships before, boyfriend, girlfriend, friends, what have you. You guys have gotten along at the beginning of the relationship. Everything was wonderful. It was so joyful. The first few weeks or the first few months, maybe even the first few years, everything was so peaceful because you didn't want anything from each other. You're just interested to get to know each other. Go to the movies, go have a coffee maybe, go spend some time at the park, walking around, talking to each other. But at some point, both of your minds started wanting something from each other. You started having expectations of each other. You started craving and desiring. You started having attachment. You had this longing with a strong eagerness. And now because you wanted certain things and they wanted certain things, eventually it caused discontentedness. There was anger, there was frustration, there was irritation, right? And now whoosh, you split, two people left, and then there's loneliness and boredom. Why? Because the mind wanted this relationship to be permanent. The mind had certain expectations of what it wanted. And when it didn't get those expectations fulfilled, i.e., when it didn't have this, when it had this mental longing with a strong eagerness, and those mental longing and strong eagerness didn't get fulfilled to your pleasing, the mind then became displeased. It became unsatisfied. It became angry and frustrated. And now, the relationship splits and the mind became sad and lonely. It became discontent. Whether they said something bad to you, whether they cheated on you, all that other stuff, we'll get to another time. But the whole reason why the mind was sad or angry or maybe even still is, sometimes I talk to people that a relationship ended five, 10 years ago and their mind is still sad or still angry because the mind is holding on. It's expecting permanence. It has a craving, desire, attachment, this mental longing for something with a strong eagerness. And as long as the mind has that for any possession, for any relationship, for any situation, it's always going to cause itself to be discontent. Let me give you another example. Let's say I buy a brand new car. I make all this money, I work really hard, I go to this car dealership and I buy this brand new car and I come out and I feel so great. The self-identity, the ego feels really wonderful. I'm driving around, my friends and my family see me in this great new car and I park it out in front of the store, go in the store and then I come out and there's a scratch on the car. 
Oh my goodness, right? The mind becomes angry, frustrated. Who scratched my car? My car, right? Becomes angry. Why? Because the mind is craving permanence. The mind wants that car to be shiny red sports car forever. I did all this work, put all this thought over many, many years into this car. And now when that scratch occurred, the mind became discontent because the mind craved permanence. Right. We're not talking about whether it was right or wrong for the guy to scratch the car. We're just talking about that car is impermanent. It's never going to look that way permanently. And if you have the wisdom to know impermanence, another person might come out, see the scratch on the car and say, hmm, thank goodness I got insurance. I better go get it fixed. And that person can be calm, peaceful, serene and content with joy because they understand when they were signing the papers of the car, they already knew it's not going to look like that permanently. But for the person whose mind doesn't understand impermanence, when that scratch shows up on the car, they're going to be highly discontent, right? So with the wisdom of impermanence and understanding that you are causing all your own discontentedness, the mind can then reside peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy because you're going to see impermanence everywhere around you. But if every time the mind doesn't get what it wants, it becomes frustrated and angry or lonely or bored or what have you. Every time the mind doesn't get what it wants, if it becomes frustrated and angry, it's going to be a pretty long life for you because there's so much impermanence in the world. You're never going to get everything you want. Never. This world isn't going to function the way that you want it to function. So as long as you go around expecting things to be your way, as long as you want things to be your way, as long as you have a craving, a desire for things to be your way, you're going to be utterly discontent because you want things to be your way. So what you need to realize as part of this second noble truth is that you are causing all the discontent feelings in the mind. Every single feeling that arises in the mind is being caused by the mind. It's being caused by this craving, this attachment, this desire, this expectations, wanting, this clinging, this grasping, this holding. The mind is causing itself to be discontent because of this condition of craving. Okay, that's the second noble truth. You are causing all your own discontentedness. The third universal truth, I'm sorry, the third noble truth. The beauty about the second noble truth is if you accept responsibility that you are causing all your discontent feelings, the third noble truth is that you can eliminate them, right? Essentially, what the second noble truth is saying is accept responsibility for all the feelings in your mind, whether it's sadness, anger, frustration, irritation, right on down the road, right on down to boredom, loneliness, shyness, and everything else. If you accept and you believe, crash, crash that belief, right? If you believe that other people are causing you to be angry. Well, it's her fault. She made me angry or it's his fault because he made me angry. If you believe that you're never going to get enlightened because it's everyone else's fault that you are angry. It's everyone else's fault. That's why people go around trying to fix everybody else. But if you accept responsibility, if you crush that belief that everyone else is causing you to be angry and you see the truth, and you gain this wisdom that you are in fact causing your own discontent mind, if you accept responsibility for all those feelings and emotions in the mind, if you accept responsibility and accountability for all of those feelings, now the third noble truth is that you can eliminate them. This is why you can attain enlightenment. This is why you can attain enlightenment because you're the one causing all the discontentedness. 
if, if it was everybody else that was causing the anger and frustration, that means you need to go around and fix 7.5 billion people in the world because it's 7.5 billion people in the world that aren't doing things your way. And if you can just get those 7.5 billion people in the world to do things your way, then the world will be peaceful, right? That's the way it works. That's wrong view. What right view is, right view is you are causing the discontent mind. And because your mind is causing itself to be discontent, the third noble truth is the elimination of the discontent mind is possible by eliminating attachments. The third noble truth is the elimination of discontentedness is possible by eliminating craving, desire, attachment, expectations, wanting, grasping, holding, the way the mind has this mental longing with a strong eagerness. If you can eliminate that and pursue things as an interest, as a goal, as an objective, eliminate that mental longing where the mind wants something so badly, it craves something so badly, it has this desire, this longing with a strong eagerness. If you can eliminate those from the mind, then you can eliminate the discontentedness because you're the one that's causing it. Your mind, because of this poison or this defilement or this unwholesome root of craving, you're going to learn about this in a few weeks. Because of this poison, this unwholesome root, this defilement of craving, desire, attachment, this mental longing with a strong eagerness, you are causing it yourself. So all we have to do is train one mind. That's all you have to do is just train one mind. You don't have to train 7.5 billion minds and all the other ones that are going to be coming after that. You just have to train one. And that's going to be hard enough. That's going to be challenging enough, but you can do it, right? Because you only have to train one. And I think you know which one you need to train. You need to train that one. You need to train your mind. How do you train the mind to eliminate this discontentedness? Well, you have to eliminate the craving, desire, attachment, the expectations, the wants, the grasping, the holding, this mental longing for something with a strong eagerness. This is breathing mindfulness meditation. Breathing mindfulness meditation is the solution to this problem of craving. Breathing mindfulness meditation, as the mind goes to the past, it goes to the future, it has thoughts and ideas and perceptions, you train it in breathing mindfulness meditation to focus on the breath, let those thoughts go. Let it go, let it go, let it go. Cut off the thoughts, let it go, let it go. Because the mind wants to hold on. The unenlightened mind wants to hold on. It wants to hold on and grasp and hold tightly. And because it's trying to hold on so tightly, it keeps causing itself to be discontent. So what you're doing in breathing mindfulness meditation is you're training the mind to let go. Let go. Relax. Let go. Right? Just let go. Let it go. Just let it go. Right? That's what breathing mindfulness meditation is doing. It's training the mind to let go. Because now, now that the mind has let go, now we can control the mind. We can be peaceful. We can be calm. We can be serene. We can be content. We can have joy because we're not holding on so tightly. Right? When we hold on, that's where the stress comes. But when we let it go, now we can be peaceful. Because now, if I've got water, I drink water. Tastes good. But if the water is all gone and I don't get water for another hour or two because it's impermanent, that's okay. 
But if the mind has this mental longing and it wants this water so badly and it can't just wait 30 minutes or an hour until the end of class to get this glass of water, then the mind's going to be discontent because of this mental longing with a strong eagerness. So the third noble truth is we can eliminate the discontent mind by eliminating this craving, desire, attachment, this mental longing with a strong eagerness. And we do that through breathing mindfulness meditation and practicing generosity, which we're going to get into later. Okay, we're going to get into both of these two solutions later. What the Four Noble Truths is getting, bringing to your awareness is that you are causing your own discontentedness, the second noble truth, and you can eliminate it through training the mind to let go. And once again, you know that this is true. Think about it. Think about the relationship that you had that ended and you felt either angry or frustrated or irritated, annoyed. And as soon as you let it go from the mind, and it might have taken a while, but as soon as you let it go, the mind became peaceful. Or that person who cut you off in traffic. Again, we're not talking about right or wrong here. We're just talking about what's causing your mind to be discontent. When that car cut you off in traffic, the mind was permanently wanting that lane. It permanently wanted that lane. And it wants a certain amount of safety. And because the mind has this mental longing for strong eagerness for that lane, when impermanence happened, when someone cut you off, the mind became angry, became discontent. Eventually, the mind was just like, all right, whatever, I'm just going to let it go. And when you let it go, that's when the mind became content. Because you let it go. Right? That's how you know this is true. Because you've been experiencing it your whole life. You just have to look around in your life and see it so that you know that it's true. And then you can gain the wisdom. The fourth noble truth. The path to eliminating discontentedness is the Eightfold Path. So the Four Noble Truths establishes right view. It helps you to understand the cause of the problem, which is your own mind, which is craving, desire, attachment. It helps you to understand that you can eliminate the problem through training the mind to eliminate that craving, desire, attachment. Then the Fourth Noble Truth says, well, if you want to eliminate this discontentedness once and for all, completely eliminated entirely, in order to attain enlightenment, you've got to practice the Eightfold Path. It's the whole path. The entire path is what's going to bring the mind to enlightenment. Okay? That's what we're going to study next week, Chapter 5 on Sunday. Very deep chapter. But here in the Four Noble Truths, we are understanding that everyone that is unenlightened is going to experience discontentedness. This is the first noble truth. The second noble truth, the cause of the discontentness is your own attachments, this mental longing with a strong eagerness, wanting everything to be permanent, wanting things to be your way, having this craving, desire, attachment, expectations. By you having that, the mind is causing itself to experience discontentedness. When you eliminate that craving, desire, attachment from the mind, that mental longing with a strong eagerness, when you eliminate that from the mind, then the mind can be peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy. And the way to do that is the fourth noble truth, the Eightfold Path, learning and practicing the Eightfold Path. Okay, that's the entire solution to the discontent mind is the Eightfold Path. The first step of the Eightfold Path is what we call right view. There's eight steps, which we're going to get into next week. But the very first step is right view. If you understand the Four Noble Truths intellectually, and maybe you don't at this point, and that's okay. You need to spend some more time with it. But you need to put it into practice because essentially... What the Four Noble Truths is doing is it's saying you are responsible. You are accountable 
for all the feelings in the mind. You are causing all the discontentedness in the mind. And because you're causing all the discontentedness, you can also eliminate it as well. So essentially, it's putting the power right back to you and saying you have the power to eliminate this. You have the ability to eliminate it because you're the one who's causing it. So the Buddhist teachings are the most profound self-accountability that you could ever experience. Because in the unenlightened state, we often walk around and we blame everyone else for our problems. We blame everyone else for our anger and our frustration because things aren't being done our way. It's everyone else's fault, right? Wrong. It's not everyone else's fault. There's no fault at all here, right? This is just the condition of the unenlightened mind. That's why I make the first noble truths that everyone is unenlightened pretty much. The whole entire world at this point. There's very few people in the world that are enlightened because these teachings aren't being shared very clearly around the world. So there's everybody's born into this world with an unenlightened mind. So you haven't done anything wrong. It's not your fault. You don't need to feel guilty that you're causing all of this problems. But now that you know that you're causing the discontent mind and it's coming from you, you've got to ask yourself, what am I going to do about it? I'm the one causing all of this discontentedness and I can solve it. It's just a matter of taking the appropriate steps to learn and practice the teachings so that I can improve the condition of the mind. And the way to do that is practice the Eightfold Path. Learn and practice the Eightfold Path. So now that you know that your mind is causing all of the discontentedness, if you accept responsibility and accountability for all those discontent feelings, then you can take steps to eliminate it. But if it's everyone else's fault, you can't do anything to fix it because you can't change anyone else. You can only change your mind. You only change one person. That's you. That's the only one you can change. So the beauty in the Four Noble Truths is by you accepting responsibility and accountability for all of those discontent feelings in the mind, you can then take actions to eliminate them. And that's what this whole path is about, is about eliminating discontentedness from the mind. So now let me open things back up. I know we had a couple of questions that we were holding for later. Max, any questions that anybody has either about the Four Noble Truths the three universal truths or any of the other questions that came up later are completely fine at this point. Thank you. Yes. So I actually asked the group if they would be interested to share an example of a time recently when they got angry or sad, and maybe we can use those as a way to explore the noble truths here. So Alan on YouTube said that he got irritated yesterday when he was on a group call and someone stopped the conversation to pull him up on how he pronounced the word. And so he's laughing about it now, but he said it was an irrelevant event, but I'm still irritated today. Right, so that's the self, right? So like um, yesterday on Alan's call, he had a certain perception. He was craving, desiring, attached. He has this mental longing, just like everyone else probably in the group, has this mental longing with a strong eagerness, holding on to this self. And when somebody kind of uh, took note of him mispronouncing a word, he got offended. He got um, irritated. And it sounds like he's a little bit irritated today too, because this offended the self, it offended the ego. And he's trying to hold on to this permanent self. He wants this permanent self rather than just recognizing impermanence, right? So this is a way that I oftentimes instruct students. It's probably why Max did it, is think about the most recent time that you were angry or frustrated or irritated. Think about that. What was the situation? And figure out what it is that you're attached to what is it that your mental longing and strong needs cause that anger, that frustration, that irritation? Right now, you might have thought prior to this that somebody else caused you to be angry or caused you to be frustrated. But dive into this deeper than that. You caused it. So what is it? So let's hear some more examples 
Max, about some situations where people were experiencing discontentedness and what were the attachments that caused it. And if you've got one, you guys can type it in and Max will share it. Think about what was the discontentedness, anger, frustration, irritation? What was the situation? And what were your craving, desire, attachment that caused it? So we have another example on Zoom and this person actually messaged me anonymously, so I'll keep them anon anonymous. And it's actually the same in my family, this as well. So this person says that their mother is still extremely angry with their father from the divorce. And it was 33 or 40, uh, 34 years ago. And like I say, it's... it's okay, this is somebody else. Okay, so this isn't yeah. your anger. This is your mom's, right? So let's talk about mom, right? So mom is craving permanence. Once dad, husband, and she's still angry because the relationship has um, dissolved and is eliminated, perhaps. It's better to talk about yours, though, because we don't necessarily know 100% what's in mom's mind. We know it's craving, desire, attachment that's causing her anger 33 years later because she hasn't let it go yet. But if you guys can share examples from your life, that's better because then you can see it for yourself about what's causing your anger, your frustration, your irritation. Look at your attachments. This might be a good time to go back to Amina's question. Yes. So Amina asks, I have a question about bringing the mind back to the middle. When mindful and understanding that we are responsible for our discontentedness and our moods, coming back to the middle sometimes happens afterwards, which means learning is happening, but the pattern continues. So for example, whenever I have to encourage my daughter to do her educational work at home, especially during the lockdown, she resists it. And my husband and I try various ways to encourage her and the mind, my mind, often becomes frustrated. Then I see the frustration is about my being attached to her, having a certain attitude about her work and doing it with a positive attitude. Then I am mindful and I let it go. I apologize to her and we move forward. But this cycle keeps happening. How can one get to the middle in the act of discontentedness? Okay, so let's review what Amina is talking about. Amina is talking about she wants things to be a certain way for her daughter. She has certain expectations. She wants her daughter to do her homework. And again, we're not talking about what's right or wrong. Because as a mom, as a parent, we need our children to do our homework. That's an important thing that we need to guide our children to do. However, what Amina is running into is that she has this longing and this strong eagerness, right? She has this craving, this desire for things to be done a certain way in a certain way. And she feels this eagerness to get it done in a certain way. And when things aren't meeting those expectations that Amina has, her mind's becoming irritated or frustrated, right? Once her mind becomes irritated or frustrated, eventually she does realize it like, wow, that's me. There's that attachment. There's that craving. There's that desire. And because I want this so badly, I'm causing my own frustration and irritation. And then Amina eventually says, OK, I'm going to eliminate it. I'm going to let it go. And now my mind can be peaceful. And I just apologize to my daughter and we're on to the next thing. So what Amina is describing there is she's describing the Four Noble Truths. She's describing the process of the mind that the mind wants something. It expects something. It has this mental longing with a strong eagerness. And when it doesn't get that, it becomes discontent. And Amina sees that because the mind is causing itself to be discontent. And then as soon as she recognizes it and she lets it go, she lets go of that mental longing and the strong eagerness. She doesn't let go of needing to do the homework because the child still needs to do the homework. We know that. What she's letting go of is she's letting go of that mental longing and the strong eagerness. And when she lets that go, then the mind can be peaceful. And now as a parent, you can guide the child. 
you can help them, you can assist them and move them towards doing the homework as a goal, as an objective, and as an interest. But the more you want it and desire it and crave it and expect it, the more you have this mental longing with a strong eagerness, the more angry the mind's going to become, the more frustrated, the more irritated. So as soon as you let that go and you just guide the child and you assist them and you work with them and you su suggest for them and move them towards their homework, then you can do it peacefully and calmly. Okay, so that's the Four Noble Truths. Amina is confirming that she sees the Four Noble Truths. She sees it in what she's experiencing. Now her question is, how do I become better at not allowing this anger or frustration or irritation to even arise? How do I get better at practicing the Four Noble Truths so that I don't even get angry to begin with? Okay, Amina, it takes time. None of this stuff is easy or quick, right? It's a slow, gradual progression of training the mind and letting go. The good news is a year ago when these things were happening, you didn't even know why they were happening. You were just angry and perhaps even blaming your daughters causing your anger. At least now you're aware. At least now you're aware of the problem of the Four Noble Truths, through the Four Noble Truths, and now you're observing that the Four Noble Truths are in fact truth, and you're gaining that wisdom, right? Now what you have to do is you just have to practice it more and more, and the sooner you acknowledge it, the sooner you cut it off, the sooner you apply all the other teachings of the Eightfold Path, namely right effort in others, you will get better at doing this, where now that you know that the homework issue is something that's arise, arising discontentedness in the mind, you know that you have the potential of doing that. So before you ever talk to your daughter about homework ever again in the future, gather yourself, prepare yourself, know that this is an attachment, this is a craving, this is a desire that you have. Just gather yourself and just calmly, patiently, walk through it and guide your daughter, right? You have to just take your time and practice the teachings. It's not going to happen overnight. But the good news is, is here that you're now aware of the problem and you're seeing it more clearly. You've just got to implement it so that you catch it. And if you can do that long before you ever have the conversation with her and kind of prepare your mind going into the conversation, then you might be able to catch it where it doesn't arise so readily. And it just takes time. Yep, these attachments, especially, so in terms of craving, desire, attachment, when it comes to children and life partners, those are some of the deepest held craving, desire, attachments that we have. And then we have our parents. These are some of the hardest ones for people to let go of. Right. Like if I didn't do my homework, Amina, you wouldn't you wouldn't be discontent. You just be like, all right, David's not doing his homework. Or if my son didn't do his homework, you would be like, OK, well, that's David's son. But because it's your daughter and you have certain expectations for her, you have attachment to her. You have to eliminate that attachment to your daughter. Some of the good ways to do that is send your daughter out to go sleep at other people's house, go let her do other things with other people and practice going away from your daughter and coming back, going away from your daughter and coming back. And while you're away from your daughter, not being worried about what she's doing and what she's involved in, just go away and come back, go away and come back. You have to let go of the mind holding on to your daughter so tightly. So there's a lot of work around your daughter, maybe some around your husband, some around your in-laws, around your mom, your dad. These are some of the hardest ones. So in terms of peeling the onion and getting to the core of the mind, if you're working on these, these are some of the more challenging ones. So that's good. Work on these 
but it's going to take you a while. The other ones are probably easy, right? The easier ones kind of fluffed off pretty easy, but these are more challenging. So enter into the conversation about homework with your daughter with the mindset that it has the potential of causing discontentedness. So hold yourself back. Just slowly talk about things one by one by one, slowly. It's going to take time. Okay, we have some more examples of recent times when people have become angry. So I'll share one from Sue. She says that recently some people took issue with a stance I took in a subject and showed their displeasure towards me. Myself felt attacked and disrespected and it shook me up for a while. I was attached to wanting these people to see things my way but I realized that it's impossible to make everyone else happy and they don't need to agree with me. Right, so that's a perfect example where Sue was trying to convince people to do things a certain way or to see her side of the story or understand things in the way that she understands them, right? This is the mind craving permanence, wanting others to see things our way. This is that mental longing with a strong eagerness. And as long as you have that longing and strong eagerness, you're wanting everybody to understand you in a certain way. As long as you hold on to that, the mind's going to be discontent because it's impossible for everyone to understand you because of impermanence. So once Sue sounds like eventually got to a situation where she tried to explain herself, she tried to help them understand her point of view, they weren't getting it, they weren't understanding it. She became discontent, but then eventually when she decided, you know what, I don't need them to understand this. It's not required that they understand it. The more I forcefully try to get them to understand this, the more discontent it's going to cause my mind. So when you let go and say, you know what, they don't have to understand me, and that's okay. Not everyone's going to agree with us. Not everybody's going to have the same opinion as us. Not everyone's going to agree with the same things that we agree with. Because if everybody agreed with us, that would be permanence. But that's what the mind wants. The mind wants permanence. The mind wants everyone to agree with us. And as soon as people start disagreeing with us, that's when the mind becomes discontent because the mind craves permanence. It wants everyone to agree. But what the mind needs to evolve to is being comfortable with someone disagreeing. It's okay. It's okay if somebody disagrees. You can have your opinion. I can have mine, and that's okay. You don't have to end this conversation with everybody agreeing with you. It's okay to walk away from a conversation where people disagree with you. But the problem that encounters when people argue and become hostile is both sides are trying to get each other to agree. And if this person feels that if I can just get this other person to agree with me, then I can leave this conversation happy because the mind wants those pleasant feelings that this person agrees with me. But if you recognize that that's not always possible because that's permanence, then you can have a conversation where there's difference of opinion and we both disagree and we can walk away from the conversation with respect, with politeness, with kindness, with friendliness, but we just disagree and that's okay. But in today's society, we've come become so polarized that we feel like everyone has to agree with us. And if they don't agree with us, then we have to keep fighting and fighting and fighting and fighting until everyone agrees with us. But you're going to be fighting for the rest of your life if you do that. Because the mind is craving permanence and it wants everyone to agree with you. And you're just going to keep fighting everyone in your life for the rest of your life. The mind's never going to be peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy because the mind keeps wanting everyone to agree with you. And you're going to keep fighting for that over and over and over again. But what the mind has to come to is realize impermanence that not everybody is going to agree with you. And that's okay. 
No one can agree. Not everyone can agree with you because that's permanence and that permanence doesn't exist. Everything is impermanent. So you got to train the mind to stop craving this permanence all the time and be able to walk away and just accept that people are going to sometimes disagree with you. And that's okay. And it sounds like that's what Sue eventually got to. And perhaps today her mind is now peaceful on that particular topic because she's recognized that those people have their opinions and they're just going to have their opinions and I have my opinion and that's okay and that's fine right that's what you have to evolve to is recognizing that everything's impermanent and not fighting so much don't argue there's no benefit to argue but just peacefully share your opinions if someone disagrees with you that's okay you can disagree everyone's got their own opinion Okay, we have an example from Manal. She says that yesterday, while on a road trip with family, we stopped by a donut shop that is known to give hot off the oven donuts with each order. The lady taking orders asked many people for their order and she saw me standing right in front of her, ready to place my order. Yet she proceeded to ask other new customers. I waited and watched. And then when yet another new customer was asked for their order, I stepped in to say I had been waiting patiently in line long before. I said it calmly, but I did step right in. I later reflected that perhaps if I waited a few more minutes, the lady at the counter might have recognized my stance. This sounds silly and so minute as I type this today. I'd like to go towards a place where I could have waited five more minutes without interjecting. Sure. And see, this is where you're going to get to the Eightfold Path and you're going to understand how to use right speech. And, you know, being enlightened doesn't mean you just sit back and you let those kind of things go. It doesn't mean you just stand there for five minutes and be ignored. Right. That's not what it means to let go. You can still step in and get acknowledged to give your order. But if you do so with hostility or with anger or frustration, that's where things are going to lead to a problem. So what the Eightfold Path is going to teach you is how to maintain your composure, maintain this peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy, and now practice something like right speech where you can get your order taken and you don't get frustrated, right? So here it sounds like the self, the ego, right, was kind of affected there, Manal. Like, here I am, acknowledge me, I am here, right? That's the self, right? Instead of just, okay, you know, that lady's probably confused and she may not associate me as being here, but let me look at her as a very loving, kind being, compassionate being. She's obviously trying to do her job. She's probably quite busy. So let me just step in with some polite words and excuse me, ma'am, I'm not sure if you saw me, but I've been waiting here for a few minutes and I think I might have been ahead of those folks. Would it be possible for me to give my order or would you like me to wait for a few more minutes? Right. If you would say something like that, now the mind can be peaceful because you're just kind of saying, hey, here, here, you know, I would like to give my order, but I can wait if you'd like me to wait. But I think I was here before them. But I'll leave it up to you, you know, what you think is best. If you'd like to take their order, you know, go ahead. But I would like to give my order at some point if it's OK or however you choose to word it. Right. Whatever words you use, you'll find the right words. But we know in that situation, the thing that's going to cause problems is if the mind becomes irritated, frustrated or angered. That's what's going to cause the problems. So here it could be attachment craving to the self, to the ego. Maybe you wanted those donuts really badly, right? You just had this longing and strong eagerness for the donuts, right? And because you wanted those donuts so badly, then the mind became irritated or annoyed in that situation. So that's how this craving, desire, attachment, this mental longing with a strong eagerness is causing the mind to be discontent. And then eventually, if you just let it go, then the mind can be 
peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy in the situation. And you can just apply good speech or right speech in order to get the results that you need. Judith says, if someone invalidates my reality, I feel I can't be myself with them. And then I feel sad or angry. Isn't that ridiculous? It's not ridiculous. It's just the unenlightened mind. It's how the unenlightened mind works, right? Because what you just said there, as you said, when someone doesn't acknowledge my reality, I can't be myself, right? The word I and self showed up in that question like three or four times because you want things to be a certain way and you have a certain image in your mind of the way things should be. And then when people don't agree with that, the mind becomes discontent because the mind longs. It has this strong eagerness for permanence. The mind wants everyone to agree with you. And when people don't agree with you, that's why your mind's discontent. Instead of recognizing impermanence. If the mind recognizes impermanence, then you should already know that not everyone's going to agree with you. Right? If you understand that it's it's impossible, it's utterly impossible for every being on this planet to agree with you because of impermanence. Impermanence is a universal truth. So what your mind is doing is it's trying to get everyone to agree with you because it craves this permanence. And when it doesn't get that permanence, that's when the mind becomes discontent. You're causing it yourself. So you've got to train the mind to let go. Just let go. If someone disagrees with you, okay, that's fine. No big deal. Doesn't change what you think or what you understand, but everyone's got a different opinion. That's impermanence. But why should it cause your mind to be discontent just because someone else has a different opinion, right? Okay, we have a question from Javier. He asks, how about physical pain, like from an illness? Okay, this is a very good one. So the mind, when the body becomes sick, the mind oftentimes becomes discontent. You get flu, you get a cold, you get sneezes, you get runny nose, you get a sinus infection, you get a broken arm, you get a twisted ankle, the mind becomes discontent. Why? Because the mind craves permanent health. The mind wants the body to be permanently healthy. The mind expects the body to be permanently healthy. The mind craves permanence. The mind craves permanence. It wants permanent health. But what the mind doesn't recognize is that it's a human body. The human body is impermanent. There's no way that this body is going to be permanently healthy. Because this body is impermanent, it's going to experience sickness, aging, and death. Those are the three things that this body can't escape. As long as you're human, you're going to experience sickness, aging, and death. But every time the body's sick, the mind is craving this permanent health. So therefore, it becomes discontent, becomes frustrated or angry. The other thing that happens is not only does it crave permanent health, but the mind is used to going outside, going to work, seeing friends, going shopping, doing all of these things. And now when the body is unhealthy, not only does it crave health, but now when it's at home laying in the bed because it's sick, the body's craving to go outside. The body's craving to go shopping, craving to go to work, craving to see family and friends. You might not even be able to eat the same foods that you normally eat right? Because you're so sick, you can't even eat the same food. So now it's craving certain foods that it wants. It has this mental longing and strong eagerness for all of these activities and all of these different things. And it's craving that the body's healthy. And now what the unenlightened mind's going to do is it's going to sit in bed and it's going to feel miserable, right? 
It's going to feel lonely. It's going to feel bored. It's going to feel angry and frustrated. The mind is going to be miserable, right? It's going to be highly discontent just because the body's sick. The body's impermanent. The body's impermanent. It can't attain permanent health. So therefore, the mind needs to be trained to understand that the body's impermanent and it's going to be sick sometimes. And that's just part of the human condition. Okay. Now, if the body gets injured, like let's say you do trip and fall and you sprain your ankle, right? The pain, the physical pain, the enlightened mind is always going to experience physical pain, right? The physical pain is there to tell the mind something's wrong, right? If we didn't have that as part of our being, we would walk around in fires, the body would get damaged, would get destroyed. <clears throat> we would walk on glass and nails and there would be all kinds of, of damage that the body would incur. So the physical pain that the body experiences is to notify the mind something's wrong here. Take your hand out of the fire, right? So that physical pain is always going to be there as an indication to tell the mind, you've got to change something here. Your body's going to be damaged by the fire, right? So that's always going to be there. But how the mind relates to that pain is going to change, right? In the unenlightened mind, you touch something that's hot, you're still going to pull your hand away, but then you're probably going to start cussing, you're going to be angry, you're going to be frustrated, you're going to be discontent, maybe worried about your skin and maybe I'm going to die. You know, the mind's going to be have all these worries, right? Because you got burned. Like I said, you may cuss, you may use some bad language. The mind's going to be angry, right? An enlightened mind still going to feel that same pain from the fire. But the mind's not going to get angry. The mind's not going to get frustrated. The mind's not going to get irritated. The enlightened mind is going to feel that pain. Oh, wow. OK, let me fix that. Let me let me make that better. Let me put on some medicine, go to the hospital, whatever I need to do. But an enlightened mind is not going to feel anger and frustration when that physical pain occurs. That's the difference between an unenlightened mind and an enlightened mind. The pain's still going to be there. The sensation of pain is still going to be there. And we need that in order to protect the physical body. But how the mind relates to that pain is going to be completely different between an unenlightened mind and an enlightened mind. An unenlightened mind is going to get angry, frustrated, irritated about the pain. An enlightened mind is going to see it as impermanent. An enlightened mind is going to know, I just need to address this medically and get it fixed. And that's impermanent. This pain is impermanent. And I just need to get it fixed so that the physical body can regain its strength and be healthy again. But this enlightened mind is never going to be discontent just because of physical pain. So the enlightened mind is going to relate to that pain differently and is going to experience that pain differently. The mind's still going to be peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy. So it's still going to acknowledge that this pain has occurred and it's going to protect the physical body, but it's not going to feel discontent as a result of that physical pain. We have a question from Nasir. She asks, I find that I practice some avoidance to keep my mind peaceful and calm. Is some avoidance okay? This is related to protecting your discontentedness. We're actually going to talk about this on Wednesday. I know on Wednesday, we normally do breathing mindfulness meditation, which we will do on Wednesday, but we're going to explore what's called the six doorways to discontentedness. Excuse me. What you're talking about, Marcia, is protecting your dic discontentedness. Protect, I'm sorry, it's pr uh, protecting your contentedness, right? So these doorways to discontentedness is what we're going to talk about on Wednesday. 
But what you're describing, Marcia, is you're protecting your contentedness by knowing if I go to that house or if I go see that friend or if I have a conversation over here, the mind's going to become discontent. So to protect my contentedness, I'm not going to engage in that conversation. That's part of what we call protecting your contentedness. In early in practice like this, this is very, very helpful. Very, very helpful. And we're going to go into a lot of descriptions about this on Wednesday. Later, once the mind becomes enlightened and closer to enlightenment, you'll be able to have any conversation with any person on the face of the earth and never experience discontentedness ever. But in the meantime, if you're using something like this to protect your contentedness, that's very helpful for you. And you can continue to do that. But if you're going to avoid a certain conversation or you're going to avoid a certain situation, don't do it with judgment, which you haven't said that you are. Still have loving kindness and compassion for the people and the situation, but you're just actively choosing not to engage because you're choosing to protect your contentedness. But if you walked away out of judgment or out of ego or you look down on these people or you thought badly of them, that's not good for your mind. But if you just know that you're protecting your contentedness and you're choosing not to engage in this conversation or this situation because you are protecting your contentedness, that's a very healthy attribute of practice that you can use for now that will maintain your peaceful mind. So that's very helpful. We have a question from Judith. She asks, is gratitude a feeling of peacefulness or is there some kind of desperateness in there? It depends. Uh, depends how you practice it, right? Gratitude by itself is just sharing with other people, just sharing your time, your effort, your resources, your energy, sharing with other people. That's just what, uh, I'm sorry, I'm thinking generosity. You said gratitude, right? Gratitude. Yes. Uh, okay. Yeah, she asked about gratitude. Uh, can you repeat the question again? Sure. So Judith asks, is gratitude a feeling of peacefulness or is there some kind of desperateness in there? Gratitude. I don't think so. I feel that if you have gratitude for something, it's appreciation, right? Like somebody's done something and you have gratitude. You might have gratitude for your parents that they gave you life. You might have gratitude for your boss to give you a job and prepare you for work and train you for work. You might have gratitude and appreciation for the food that you get to eat every day because you and your husband work or your partner or however you get your food and your clothing. You might have gratitude for that. That's a very healthy quality to have gratitude and appreciation for the things around you. That means you're not taking uh, taking it for granted, right? If you didn't have gratitude, that could lead to unwholesome mental qualities. But having gratitude and appreciation is a wholesome mental quality that will help you cultivate uh, good, wholesome relationships and good, wholesome things in your life. I know, David, that in a lot of personal development circles these days, gratitude is something that is encouraged. That we should practice gratitude every day and yes. write in our gratitude journal. And I feel that this is very wholesome because it essentially allows us to let go of our expectations and our wants, our cravings. And yet at the same time, I see what Judith is getting at here because if we have a craving to write in our gratitude journal every day, right? It, we're starting to kind of reach out and try and find things that we, you know, oh, what's next? What can I be grateful for? And there, I think there is a, a potential risk there of it spilling over into craving. And often it is actually taught or encouraged alongside other narratives that say, you know, go out there and achieve everything you want, get everything you want. And, you know, that a good life is built on getting what you want. And so there's a lot of maybe quite problematic um, ideas that can come along with it. But you know, by itself, expressing gratitude is 
like letting go essentially. When I think of gratitude, I think about you having gratitude for other things or other people, right? Having appreciation for others. That's what I think of of gratitude. Now, if you <clears throat> if you have a craving, if you have a desire, if you have a mental longing with a strong eagerness for others to have gratitude for you, right? To be appreciative of your words and your actions. That's where you can run into problems. If you have this craving that I'm going to go around and do all of these really good things and I would like to hear everyone say thank you. I would like to hear everyone say how much they appreciate me. I would like to and I'm only doing these things because I want this from other people. I want them to express their gratitude to me. I want them to express their appreciation to me for having done these things. That's a craving. That's a mental longing with a strong eagerness because you're wanting something. You're expecting something. You have this mental longing with a strong eagerness for something from other people. But if you're just practicing gratitude and appreciation yourself for the things that are in your life and for the people that are in your life, that's a good quality. But if you're wanting and expecting it from other people, that's where it can lead to discontentedness because your expectation of wanting gratitude and appreciation from others is never going to be fulfilled to your level of your expectation. So that's where you can cause your mind to be discontent back to these Four Noble Truths is having that mental longing and strong eagerness for someone else to express gratitude to you if if the mind doesn't get that, then the mind is going to be discontent and the mind's not always going to get it because some people just don't say thank you. Some people might feel it inside. They might feel appreciation and gratitude, but they never say thank you. Right. So if you are expecting the thank you or you're expecting the gratitude or appreciation and it doesn't come, that's when you cause discontentedness for yourself because now you have this mental longing and strong eagerness that you want something and when it doesn't occur the mind's going to be discontent so it's best to practice generosity for example without any interest in anything in return don't have any expectation of what should come to you as a result of your generous deeds but just do it because you know it's the right thing to do and if nobody says thank you, then that's completely fine, right? For example, I just published this audio book that I worked on for two or three months, right? I worked on this audio book extensive amount of hours for two or three months. And I put it out there on the podcast site. And now recently I put it out on the YouTube site and it's put out a couple other places. I did that because I know it was a good, wholesome thing to do. And I know it's going to help a lot of people. I had no expectation of what was going to be the result of that. I knew that people were going to get benefit. I knew they were going to get help. I knew that they would uh, make progress learning with this audiobook. But I had no expectation of everybody to say thank you. I appreciate it. Glad, you know, thank you for doing this. You're so kind. You're so polite. That's what ultimately ended up happening. What I noticed, it kind of surprised me actually because I didn't have any expectation. I just sent out the Facebook post and said, here you go, everybody. I've been working on this for two or three months. Now it's available for you. Enjoy it. And I think I went to sleep or I went somewhere with my son or something. And I came back like four, five, six hours later. And I was like, oh, wow. There was like all these posts thanking me and whying me and showing appreciation. I was like, huh. I had to think about it for a second. I was like, Oh, okay. Yeah, I understand. Like people are appreciative. But because I had no expectation, my mind was peaceful, calm, serene, and content if nobody said thank you. And it was also peaceful, calm, serene, and content when a lot of people said thank you and showed appreciation. So by not having expectation, by not having that mental longing with a strong eagerness, you won't ever be discontent because the mind won't be longing and expecting things. And conversely, this is another way that it shows up. When I was doing this audiobook project, I thought it was going to be like a two, three, four week thing. 
and it was going to be done, right? But when we dove into it, you know, it took us two, three months, four months to really put it together. But I wasn't attached. I wasn't longing for it to be done in two or three weeks. If I had this burning, if I had this mental yearning, this longing and strong eagerness for it to be done in two or three weeks, then I probably would have made a whole bunch of irrational decisions just to hurry up and get that deadline met. And it might have came, it might have been finished in three weeks, but it wouldn't have been very good quality because I would have made all these haphazard decisions along the way just to get it done and meet that expectation of three weeks. And I knew there was a lot of people waiting for this audiobook. But at the same time, what was important for me was to do it right, to do it well, right? So even though I went into the project thinking that it was going to take two or three weeks, I wasn't attached to that. So as I was noticing that it was taking longer and longer, I just let it be and just be satisfied with what is. And I just dedicated myself to doing the work, getting the work done and making good, wholesome decisions all the way along the way. And then eventually when it ended up being a, a few month project, two or three months, and I was like, OK, well, it's done now. So I wasn't disappointed. I wasn't upset. I wasn't frustrated. I wasn't putting pressure on the audio sound studio and sound engineer to hurry up and get it done. So because I wasn't putting pressure on him and I wasn't forcing him to do it, he was able to be creative and take his time and get it done in the right way. And because I wasn't putting pressure on myself, I was making good, wholesome decisions to show up to each individual recording session with a fresh voice and making sure that we did a really good job. So I didn't have expectations in the creation of this audiobook. So when it took two or three months, four months to do it, I wasn't disappointed that it took that amount of time because I wasn't attached to how long it should take. And then once I published it, I wasn't attached to getting any kind of accolades or that a boy, good job or anything like that. I was just sharing this product that I had produced just because I knew it was the good, wholesome thing to do. And I just did it just to do it because I know it would be beneficial, but I had no expectation of anything in return from any of the students or anybody who learned from it. I didn't even expect money for it. That's why I gave it away for free. So by having no expectations of the actions that I was taking, my mind all the way through was peaceful, calm, serene, and content. I wasn't, oh my goodness, it's been six weeks and I don't have it done yet. There's you know 10,000 people that are waiting for this. Oh my goodness, it's it's been two months and we're not done yet. Come on, engineer. Come on, sound guy. Hurry up and get it done. Hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. You know, I wasn't running out of the house every day to hurry up and go to the sound engineer's house. I just did it calmly and peacefully and it got finished when it got finished. And the mind was peaceful, calm, serene and content all the way through the project. And when I published it as well, because there was no expectation, it was just applying good, wholesome decisions all the way through, making sure that I was doing a good quality job because whether it took three months or it took three weeks, it really doesn't matter. What's important is that the end product was a good quality product because then it could help people. Whereas if I was attached or if I had this mental longing with a strong eagerness for the time, that it had to be finished in three weeks. Now I'm going to make all these irrational decisions just to meet that artificial timeline, which is going to drive the mind to make all these decisions that aren't necessarily going to produce the best product. But because my interest was produce the best product, the time didn't matter to me. It was more about making sure we got the right product. And now, and certainly two, three, four, five years from now, whether this project took three, three weeks or three months, it really doesn't matter, right? It's not going to matter whether it took three weeks or three months. It doesn't matter now, and it's not going to matter a year from now, and it's not going to matter two years from now how long it actually took to produce the product. What was important is that we had a good quality product when we got to the end of it. With that said, there was also things that 
once we were finished at the th two or three month mark, myself and the sound engineer were listening to it backwards and we're like, ah, we could have did that better. Ah, we could have did that better. Oh, we, we could easily re-record that and make it better. But that's where we have to find the middle, right? If we would have rushed at it too fast and too quick, we would have made too many haphazard decisions and we wouldn't have gotten a good product. Whereas if we would have just tweaked and tweaked and tweaked and tweaked this thing until never end, then we would have been six months a year before this audiobook was finished and we would have just been tweaking and tweaking and tweaking. So we had to find the middle of, okay, let's put our good work and effort into it. Let's produce a good product, but not let's, let's not overproduce it. Let's not over tweak it and deliver it to the people who supported the project, which is you guys. So this is how you can apply this in daily life is by not having this longing, this craving, this desiring, this strong eagerness, this attachments, these expectations, this wanting, you can actually pursue things as a goal, as an interest and as an objective, and you can actually be much better at your job, at your personal, your professor, professional lives, your children, with everybody involved, if you don't pursue it with such strong desire, you can actually be much more successful in everything that you do. I want to tell you this story. You may have another question, but I want to tell you this quick little story. One of my first encounters with Thai people, before I ever knew anything about Buddhism, it was probably like the first two or three weeks that I was ever around Thai people. We decided that we were all going to go to the movies. Okay, it was me and a Thai friend that was living with me and then a bunch of other Thai people. And they were all supposed to meet us at the movies. And we showed up to the movies. And usually when I go to the movies, I look online, check all the movies. I know exactly what time the movie's starting. I show up to the ticket booth, I buy the ticket, and boom, I go into the movie. But for some reason, when I went out with this group of Thai people, I didn't check. I just knew like, okay, we're going out to the movies and we'll just meet everybody at the movie theater. And I may have even have asked the Thai girl that I went with, I was like, what movie are we going to see? And she said, I don't know, we're going to decide when we get there. And I was like, all right, we'll just decide when we get there. Well, here I am standing in the circle with about six or eight Thai people. And my mind at the time is like, all right, what movie are we going to see? Like, here we are, we're at the movies. Like, what movie are we going to see? What I noticed is that they were more interested in spending time with each other. The movie was kind of like, just like an, a sideshow. The real thing that the Thai people were interested in was spending the time together, right? And like having the relationship and, and actually enjoying their time together. So while we were standing in this circle, we were all kind of like talking back and forth about what movie we were going to see. And nobody was like really eager to pick the movie. You know, normally if you were in a group of friends, at least the friends that I had before this, everybody would be advocating for their movie, right? Like, oh, we've got to see Superman or we've got to see Batman and here's why or we've got to see this action movie or this and everyone's going to be advocating and almost arguing over what is the movie to actually see. But these people were just kind of like really not even really interested in picking a movie, truthfully. They were really more interested in just spending time together. And we were just finally I, I was like, OK, movie, like what movie are we going to see? And then they all just kind of looked around at each other and they're like, up to you, you pick. And I was like blown away by this, right? Like, because I was used to being in a group of people where everybody advocated for a certain thing. Everybody had certain strong views. And it was like a fight to death to get everyone to agree with what it is that you wanted to agree with. But here are all these people that I just met, didn't know me at all. And they were just like, here, you pick. It's up to you, whatever you want to see. I was blown away by this, but this is essentially non-attachment, right? Like the mind can be peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy, no matter what, right? Whether we see Batman, we see Superman, we see an action movie, we see a comedy, we see a horror movie, I'm fine either way. It's up, you know, whatever you want it to do. So 
when they put it to me and they said, it's up to you, I was like, why is it up to me? It should be up to you. So we like stood there for like 15 minutes trying to get somebody to make a decision of who was going to watch the movie because nobody was attached to picking the movie. And eventually I was just like, all right, well, I'll pick the movie. And I just picked the movie and we went and saw whatever movie we saw. But this is what it's like sometimes when there's not an attachment is sometimes people don't want to make a decision, but other times you kind of have to just step up and make a decision. But this really struck me, it struck me as odd, right? This isn't how I live my life now. But at that particular moment in my life, having no exposure to these teachings whatsoever, to be surrounded by a group of about six or eight Thai people, and nobody was interested in picking a movie, they were more interested in just spending time together. That to me really captures a lot of what non-attachment is about, is it's not being attached to any particular outcome, not being attached to the outcome, but enjoying the journey, right? This is what non-attachment is like. So back to Amina's question about her homework with her daughter. Yes, there's a certain outcome that we're looking for is the child to do homework, but don't be attached to that outcome and just enjoy the journey, Amina. Enjoy the journey of providing guidance to your daughter along the way and realize that it is a journey. Realize that it's a gradual progression of teaching and guiding your daughter along this path. But if you hold on to this outcome and you've just got to have this certain outcome, that's when the mind's going to be discontent because it's not always going to get that outcome because the outcome is impermanent. It's not always going to be the results that you expect. And because you can't get all the results that you always expect because of impermanence, why even have expectations to begin with? work as a goal, work as an interest, work in as, as an objective to try to get what it is that you're seeking to get out of this situation. But ultimately, if you don't get that, then that's okay. And the mind can still be peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy, but still work in that direction as an objective, as a goal, as an interest. Thanks for that, David. And really nice story there, I think, for illustrating attachment and non-attachment. I feel like when the mind does attach, it tries to essentially control an outcome or control a future event in some way. We also make a kind of judgment when we do that, where we tacitly say to ourselves, this is the outcome I need in order to be content. And we don't actually know that that's the best outcome at all. It's only by attaching and not getting it that we cause ourselves to be discontent. So if we, we may think that we have to see Godzilla at 4 p.m., but in doing that, we, we assume that seeing something else at 5 p.m. is a worse option, but we don't actually know that at all. <laughs> it's just a, a kind of assumption that the mind makes because of this craving. The key word that you're using there, Max, is control. When the mind has craving, desire, attachment, expectations once when the mind has this mental longing with a strong eagerness the mind will try to control the situation it will try to push and pull and force the situation to get the desired results and if you get that desired result the mind might be happy temporarily but you had to knock down a whole bunch of trees in the forest to get there and now you look back and you see all the trees knocked down and you're like whoa i just knocked down the forest or in other words, you might get the results that you're looking for, but you had to talk awfully harsh and aggressive to a lot of people and you damaged a lot of relationships on the way to getting that desired outcome. And because you're trying to control the situation to get that desired outcome, now you're trying to control it and you're going to have a lot of forcefulness and aggressiveness as part of it. Whereas if you gradually work towards a certain objective, the mind can then arrive to that objective or not and be peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy. So you can arrive to these objectives very peacefully, very calmly, because you didn't have to control or force to get it there, right? And that's the important thing. Don't control your partners. Don't control your children. Don't even control your own aspects of I've got to get this, I've got to get that, and if I don't get this, I'm not going to be happy. 
right? But when the mind starts trying to control the situation, that's the mental longing. That's the strong eagerness, that control. And you've got to let that go and work as a objective, as an interest, and as a goal and work together as a group in order to obtain this goal or this objective. That's right. Thank you, David. We have no more questions. Okay. So I will just wish you guys all a really great week. Make sure you dive into the Four Noble Truths because without deeply understanding the Four Noble Truths that you cause the mind to be discontent, you're going to have challenges to understand the rest of this path that Gautama Buddha laid out for you. He provides us this Eightfold Path as a way to journey along this path and progress to an enlightened mind where we train the mind. But all of that is based on right view, which is the very first step of the Eightfold Path. Essentially, if you're at the point now, or you can get to that point over the next few days or next few weeks, is get to the point where you can see all of the discontent feelings that arise in the mind are being caused by you, okay? That you are in fact causing all the anger, sadness, frustration, irritation, annoyance, boredom, loneliness, guilt, shame, fears. When those feelings and emotions arise in the mind, there's something that the mind wants really badly. It's got some longing or strong eagerness of something that it wants. And when you can identify what those things are, it doesn't mean that you stop pursuing the goal. It just means that you ratchet it back and you don't pursue it so aggressively, that you pursue it as an interest, a goal, an objective. So whenever the mind becomes discontent, any discontent feeling, even when it becomes happy, even when it becomes excited or elated, there's something that the mind craved. And when it got it, that's when it became happy, excited, and elated, right? Because that's part of the discontentness too. There was some condition that created that pleasant feeling. And because the mind had something it was searching for, it was longing for, it had this strong eagerness for, that's what caused the happiness is because it got that certain something. So you've got to see this, that you are causing all the discontentedness, the painful feelings, the pleasant feelings, the feelings that are neither painful nor pleasant. When you accept responsibility for all those feelings and emotions, realizing that you're the one who's causing it, now it's just a matter of training the mind to eliminate those things. And that's what the whole rest of this program is about, is about training the mind to eliminate the discontentedness. This is the talk that explains to you what the cause of the problem is and that there is in fact a solution to this discontentedness. The solution to the discontentedness is all the Buddhist teachings, which is basically focused around the Eightfold Path. So you've got to get to the point where you can see these three universal truths more and more clearly, have that as wisdom, and see the Four Noble Truths more and more clearly, and you can see that as wisdom as well. Because once you accept responsibility for the discontent mind, all those feelings, now it's just a matter of training the mind so that you can control the mind. Right now, the reason why you're experiencing these discontent feelings, yes, is because of the craving, that's what's causing it, that mental longing with strong eagerness. But because the mind is untrained, you can't control the mind. The mind gets shaken up. When somebody says something displeasing or something happens that you don't like, the mind gets shaken up because you can't control it. You can't control the mind because you haven't trained the mind. So what the whole rest of this program is about it's about training the mind so that you can then control it. Awakening the mind to this wisdom, and part of that wisdom is training the mind so that then you can control it. And once you can control the mind, now you'll never experience discontentedness ever again because you've gradually, gradually, gradually trained the mind to this enlightened mental state. Okay, so continue to read the book, 
listen to the audiobooks. You've got that now either on podcasts or YouTube. Listen to the talk that I did six months ago about the Four Noble Truths because it's completely different. I mean, it's the same content, but the way I explained it, the examples that I use, there's a podcast from six months ago that I talked about the Four Noble Truths as well. There's also a video on YouTube. It's a little like 15, 20 minute video that I talked about the Four Noble Truths very short way. So between the book, between the audio book, the videos, the podcast, personal guidance, if you sink your teeth into this and really make sure you get the Four Noble Truths and make sure you understand the wisdom in them, then you've got what you need to continue and, and continue to build on top of that. But don't be complacent. Don't allow this week to get away from you where you just had this talk today and then you just kind of get into the rest of your week. Really use this time to make sure you really understand it. If you need to reach out to me privately by Facebook chat, or if you wanna do a private video chat through Zoom or Facebook video chat or something like that, we can do that where I talk with you privately. So I'm making myself available to you and I'm making all these resources available to you so that you can really deeply understand that you are the cause of the discontent mind and you can solve it through training the mind. So until Wednesday, I'll just wish you a very good, happy rest of your week. On Wednesday, we're going to be talking about the six doorways to discontentedness and how to protect your contentedness. And we're going to be doing breathing mindfulness meditation, which is the training to eliminate craving desire attachment. So you need the breathing mindfulness meditation in order to train the mind towards this enlightened mental state. So have a very good rest of your week and I'll see you on Wednesday at nine and then next Sunday at nine for the Eightfold Path where we're gonna dive into this even more deeply. Until then, take care. Sawadikap. Thank you again for watching. Enjoy your meditation. Look forward to seeing you online and answering any questions that you might have. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.